Shit just got real. On September 24th, 2010, I was sentenced 15 to life for carjacking, robbery, and gang enhancements. I had given the DA a reason to send me away for a possible lifetime. And normally, this would be seen as rock bottom. Yet this disease known as addiction had not even taken a full stronghold on me yet. The worst was yet to come. And my mindset back then is why I would like to open up about how I was mentally imprisoned the day I decided to dedicate my full effort to my neighborhood. And when I first began my road to recovery, finding out why I was the way I was, it wasn't easy or easy to talk about. Accepting that I was a poor decision maker wasn't in my vocabulary. At about seven or eight years old, roughly, my mother was married to a guy named Bob, a great guy, but a guy nonetheless. And sometimes I got a chance to ride quads in the canyons with the guys, Bob and a few friends. I remember one night they gave me a sip of beer. And even though I thought it was disgusting, I liked the fact I felt included with the big boys. He didn't make it a habit, but I learned I could seek approval that way. At around 11 or 12, my mother and I moved to Tustin, California, on the border of Santa Ana. I hung out with the skaters at school, but I lived around a lot of gang members, some of which I also knew from school. My mother did all the tangible things right. I never went hungry, I had enough clothes, and she was a great provider. She was also argumentative, confrontational, and would talk down to me. Almost every day consisted of heated arguments, and the few times I tried to tell her how I felt about her talking so harshly to me, I would be mocked and laughed at like my feelings were irrelevant. It was a very one-sided relationship, and sometimes I would play guitar or listen to music in my room for hours just to get away from her. One time, my friends and I were skating, and one of them had some weed. I was acting like it was nothing, but I was nervous. Feeling like an outsider in my own home, I was desperate to fit in. So on my turn, I took a huge hit and started coughing. I got pats on the back of encouragement, and it felt good. From that day on, I was always in search of some weed to smoke. I started buying it from the cholos that I lived around and went to school with. I noticed that the pretty girls would swoon around them, and the dudes treated them like movie stars. This infatuated me, and I wanted that acceptance. By 13, I was growing my own weed. And one day at school, a guy confronted me for taking his girlfriend. He got all loud and told me to meet him in the fighting spot after school. Every day there were fist fights there, and these dudes were already experienced fist slingers compared to me. So I was scared, but up for it. Luckily, he didn't show up. But I noticed just by being there, kids were looking at me with a look I could not yet identify. I walked home with my friends, and the cholos, who were talking about how my enemy bitched out. I joined in as a way to keep the attention off me and how nervous I was. I was told I should prove a point and do something in school to retaliate. In elementary, I was a bully, but I only bullied kids who wouldn't fight back or ones that ran from me. So I figured I would bring my switchblade and scare them. I brought it and courted him in the bathroom with it, but I allowed him to run out so as to enjoy the chase. When I stopped, a lot of kids were looking at me with fear, and the cholos looked on with admiration. The girls seemed to be giggly over it, too. I was told on, and Tustin Police Department came to school, found the knife on me, and gave me a court date. I was expelled from school and put on probation. I went to another junior high where word had already spread about the incident, and I know a few dudes here from around the neighborhood, too. Sometimes they would invite me to their hangout spot, but I usually felt out of place because I was white and they were Mexican. They were also known as the cool kids, and I liked to get high with them. One day, my mom stayed home from work, either sick or hungover, and she found my weed plants. She called the cops and I got arrested. I felt betrayed and abandoned. In juvenile hall, I saw a few guys I knew from school, cholos. Most kids there were gang members, and whether affiliated or not, if you didn't defend yourself, you became a victim. 
when you fought, you'd be rallied around it after. So I was learning that if you got high, you drink, you have drugs, or if you display violence, that you're the man. Got it. In court, my mother told the judge she wanted me to go to a program to straighten out my behavior. This enhanced my feelings about not being good enough. In placement, I felt out of place. A lot of kids were taken from their homes for social services issues, but a few were on probation like I was. So this was my crowd as we related to each other. You could get away with a lot of fighting here, and it was here that I sharpened my skills. Once back in juvenile hall, I got the okay from one of my boys to start gangbanging. Though that wasn't the day I got jumped in, it was the day I became imprisoned by a belief system that was based on the code of the streets. No snitching, no sex crimes, no type of child abuse, and no weakness. Most everything else was fair game and even encouraged. From this point on, my behavior was dictated based on other people's expectations. But I needed to be more aggressive. Extra out. Especially being white from a Mexican gang, I had no room to slip up. No room for mistakes, no stains on my jacket. Anything my boys did, I did more. You put in work, I'll do more. You get high, I'll do more. You fight, I'll fight more. You had a good rep, I wanted a better one. I was especially mean so as to keep any attention off of me. The confrontational style I developed from my mother, it carried over well to help me cover up my fear of exposure. I started getting addicted to the feeling of power I would get after a fight. I would be met with handshakes and respect. I got to the point in juvenile hall where you either knew me or you knew about me. My void was filled with a twisted version of love. And when I ran from placements, I would go to the neighborhood and engulf myself in street life. I quickly learned that drugs sell themselves. At 15, I did speed for the first time. I felt electric and bulletproof. Superman didn't have shit on me. An older homie got me high when I was on the run. It was just another situation in which my desire to feel accepted was overwhelming. I caved to the pressure. I remember when I was younger, my mom rarely allowed my dad to come around, saying he was on drugs or speed. When he was allowed to see me, he would bring me toys and buy me stuff. I always felt good around him, and I didn't see how bad drugs could be. So I never got to see the ugly side of addiction. After years of this type of behavior, my brain became hardwired and tailored to these actions and feelings. Constantly seeking the approval of the streets by committing crimes, and getting high to fill my emptiness. I was fully committed to the game and I loved it. I ended up in county jail at 18 and in state prison by 19, where I was just expanding my ability to be a better criminal. My third prison term in 2007, this life case came up, an incident from 2006. I went out to court from Ironwood State Prison where I fought my case for a couple years and lost. Inmates sentenced to life at this time known as lifers, were getting granted parole less than 1% of the time. So I had no hope of getting out. I went to county jail, to Wasco reception, to Pelican Bay, to Centinella, where I started slamming or injecting. My reasoning was simple. $10 worth of, $10 worth of dope on the streets cost $50 in here. And I wanted to get my money's worth. When you inject it, it hits you harder and more intensely than any other way and it comes with an initial rush of bliss and ecstasy that is unmatched by anything that I've ever felt. Sex, roller coasters, anything. From 2013 to 2016, I went on the overdose on heroin four times. Three of those times, I had to get brought back to life with Narcan and taken by ambulance to a hospital. Two of those three times, CPR was performed on me. Once was by my celly or my cellmate, and the other was by a corrections officer. My last OD in 2016 was when I got accepted into a college program here in Donovan State Prison with Southwestern College. A chance to receive my associates in business administration. From 2012 on, law started changing for lifers where the state started favoring rehabilitative programs in order to show the Board of Prison Terms a chance to show change so they can go home. I saw this program as an opportunity to do something good for myself. 
but I was strung out on heroin, where if I didn't have it, I would have withdrawals, flu-like symptoms, including diarrhea, vomiting, sleepless nights, cold sweats, and chills. I needed to get off, but I couldn't kick cold turkey. I needed help. So for the next five days, I self-medicated myself with crystal meth. I didn't want to stop using altogether. I just didn't want to be strung out. I wanted to be a functioning addict, just like my mother was a functioning alcoholic. If she could do it, I didn't see why I couldn't. After five days of no sleep, I did some heroin to get some rest. My body didn't respond well to this, and I fell out. I had no celly at the time, so luckily the corrections officer walked by and see me on the floor. The ambulance came and revived me with Narcan. And again, I was taken to the hospital. From my multiple overdose history, the prison treated this as a crisis, as a with my multiple overdose history, the prison treated this as a suicide and put me in a crisis bed. I was humiliated, only allowed to wear a one-piece orange smock, barely covering my private area for the first week before giving my boxers and t-shirt. I told mental health that I just party hard and that I use crystal meth to help kick heroin. They said if I really wanted help, they would enroll me into SAP, which is a substance abuse program. And I said, okay. These overdoses are a prime example of the irrational thinking of an addict. The first time, I did too much. The second, I mixed drinking with heroin. The last two, I had been up for a few days with no sleep. Each time, I found a mistake and was careful to avoid it so as to continue getting high. And I was doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I started SAP. In the beginning, I was still getting high here and there, but I was learning the terms for all my behaviors. I was still convinced I could control my drug use. Once I started seeing people that use on the prison yard demonstrate the exact behavior I was learning in SAP, I really started paying attention. I would read things and see that damn near everything I read would make me feel like I was reading a study on myself. It was the weirdest feeling I've ever had in my life. Seeing how the mentors and counselors conducted such a positive attitude while having a past like mine was inspiring. If they could do it, I didn't see why I couldn't either. Change occurs when you start to question yourself. Coming to the reality that what you want to be true and what really is true is two different things. Questioning what had become my second nature. I was taught it's the equivalent of wearing glasses with blue lenses your entire life and then someone comes and takes them off. Imagine that. All the new angles you would have to analyze life from. You would have a whole new world to learn. And the recovery process is that complex. I graduated SAP in nine months, and they decided to hire me as a clerk, where I continued to stay clean, join groups, and progress in my own rehabilitation. In April of 2018, I was promoted to SAP mentor slash group facilitator. Because I had transformed before people's eyes, a lot of people sought me out for their own addiction problems. And I always make time for this. The reputation of our past and present are night and day different. When people hear about how I used to be, I'm told they can't see that person in me and it makes me feel like a million bucks. I've been sober since May of 2017. I'm still accepted and rallied around, but in a better aspect of life. I, pr I proudly promote sobriety and change and love showing people that regardless, they too can achieve this. It took over two decades to develop into a seasoned criminal. And the struggle to detach from that is very real, it's very hard, but it's very possible. Because of my past, people listen when I speak about the ups and downs of addiction. It took me over 20 years, countless lives ruined, crime committed for sport, four overdoses and a life sentence before I realized something gotta change. Not everybody survives this lifestyle, but everything in my power, I utilize to help those who need it. And as a wise man once said, you can't fix a problem with the same thinking that created it. His name was Albert Einstein. Thank you.